Hi everyone, this video will be about limits. Limit for x going to x0, f of x is equal to a if there is a delta for each epsilon such that the absolute value of f of x minus a is less than epsilon for each x lying in the interval x0 minus delta. No, not really these limits. Do you know how fast you are driving? No, but I know very well where I am. Speed limits neither. In particular, we aren't going to discuss the Heisenberg's uncertainty principle at all. If you are starting to wonder whether you are on the right YouTube channel, then let me assure you that yes, this is the channel on statistical methods in high energy physics, and we are going to talk about limits on parameters of new physics theories. Let's imagine we've done our experiment and we didn't find the signal we were looking for. A hypothetical particle, the SpongeBob boson, let's say. However, we shouldn't have any bad feelings about the cheerless result of our experiment. We cannot order nature that this and this particle must exist. We should definitely report the result of the experiment to tell people that the particle doesn't exist. Almost always, new theories have three parameters, and we should work hard and exclude the biggest possible part of the parameter space. Typical parameters are masses of new particles, coupling constants, or just branching ratios, cross-sections, and so on. A hypothesis about a new theory is determined by fixing values of all three parameters. People set limits on the three parameters by testing individual points on a predefined grid in the parameter space and then just interpolating between the points. Let's emphasize one important difference between discoveries and limit setting, the size of the test. A discovery in particle physics has, most often, very far-reaching consequences. Therefore, people want to be extremely sure about the result, and they require a significance of at least 5 sigma. This corresponds to a probability of 2.9 times 10 to the minus 7. On the other hand, an exclusion of one point in a huge parameter space of one of many new theories has less consequences, and therefore a typical size of a test is much lower. The most common test size is, nowadays, 0.05. In one of the previous videos, we defined the test statistic t sub mu vector. t sub mu vector is equal to minus 2 logarithm of L of mu vector theta vector head head of mu vector over L of mu vector head theta vector head. We also said that this test statistic wasn't suitable for discoveries because of reporting discrepancy with the background-only hypothesis for both excesses and deficits of data events. For the same reason, it is not suitable for limit setting neither. An obvious remark. When setting limits, the null hypothesis H0 that we test is the new theory and all its three parameters are fixed to some values. The alternative hypothesis predicts just background. Definitely, we don't want to exclude a theory if we observe an excess of events over the background-only expectation. In analogy with the test statistic for discovery, let's define the one-sided test statistic for exclusion. Q sub mu is equal to t sub mu if mu hat is lower than mu and it is equal to zero if mu hat is greater than mu. Thanks to Mr. Wilkes and his theorem, we know the distribution of this test statistic in the large sample limit. Large sample means that there are at least about five events in each bin of our histogram. Now the distribution. 
f of q sub mu given mu is approximately equal to one half of the delta function of q sub mu plus one half of the chi square distribution with one degree of freedom of q sub mu. Then, formula for the p value and significance are p sub mu is equal to 1 minus the cumulative distribution of q sub mu given mu, and this is approximately equal to 1 minus the cumulative distribution of the standard Gaussian phi of the square root of q sub mu. z sub mu is equal to the inverse of phi of 1 minus p sub mu, and this is approximately equal to the square root of q sub mu. A very common maniplot is the cross-section upper limit as a function of one chosen parameter of the new theory. All other theory parameters are fixed to some representative values. To make the plot, we first define a grid, or a step size, in the one-dimensional parameter space. Then, for each point, we solve the equation p sub mu is equal to alpha. In practice, we perform a set of tests where each test focuses on a different value of mu. We can plot the dependence of the p-value on mu. The interpolation between adjacent points can be just linear. The mu-value that yields the p-value equal to alpha is our upper limit on mu. The upper limit on the cross-section is a product of the nominal cross-section and the upper limit on mu. Up to now, we talked about observed limits, those based on real data. However, people are also curious about expected limits, hypothetical limits we could get in case of no signal observation. The median of the p-value, if no signal exists, can be estimated very accurately with the use of the Asimov dataset. When setting limits, the Asimov dataset is equal to the background prediction. For example, the expected upper limit on the signal strength is determined by solving the following equation for mu. Median of p sub mu given the hypothesis of mu equal to zero is approximately equal to 1 minus phi of the square root of q sub mu a and this is equal to 0 0.05. When setting limits, we can easily run into a situation in which the null and the alternative hypotheses predict a very similar distributions of the test statistic. Obviously, such a test has a very low power. In an extreme, but not uncommon, case, the power can be as low as alpha. If this happens, and assuming the background-only hypothesis is true, there is a probability of alpha or similar to reject the new physics model in a test that is insensitive to it. Unfortunately, we drift towards this regime when calculating upper limits on mu. We test lower and lower values of mu until we find such mu for which p sub mu is equal to alpha. Also note that we should get negative upper limit on mu in fraction alpha of cases. Whenever q sub mu picked from f of q sub mu given zero is in the high tail of this distribution, tail that has an integral of alpha, 
the curve for p-value as a function of mu doesn't cross the line at alpha for any positive mu value. A solution to this problem is to replace the p-value by some quantity that takes into account the power of the test. Such a quantity can be Cl mu is definitely equal to p sub mu over 1 minus p0 Here, 1 minus p0 is equal to the integral from q sub mu ops to infinity f of q sub mu given 0 d q sub mu. In this context, a more common notation for the same quantities is CLS is definitely equal to the p sub s plus b over 1 minus p sub b. This is the famous CLS method that you will meet in every other LHC paper. Let's stress that CLS makes limits weaker whenever our test has low sensitivity to the signal. When we have two similar distributions of the test statistic q sub mu, predicted by the background plus signal and the background only hypothesis.